Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. I'm Stephen Sachs. I'm the artistic director of the Fountain Theater. And welcome to Theater Talk. We're streaming live on Facebook, on Twitter, YouTube, Zoom, and our Fountain Theater website. And if you're watching on Zoom, and if you have a question for our guest uh, today, just type it into the, the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And if you're watching on Facebook, type your question in the chat. So uh, our guest today is an award-winning theater artist and novelist. Her critically acclaimed drama, The Battle of Emmett Till, premiered at the Goodman Theater in Chicago in 2008, winning the Mystery Writers of America Edgar Award for Best Play. We debuted the West Coast premiere at, uh, at the Fountain Theater in 2010, uh, winning six Ovation Awards, including Best Production for Drama Desk Critics Circle Awards, including Best Production, and the Backstage Garland Award for Best Playwriting. And we are launching, as many of you know, a special live stream presentation of The Ballad of Emmett Till tomorrow, uh, Friday, August 28th at 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And to make your uh, pay-per-view reservation, go to fountaintheater.com. Uh, the, the live stream event tomorrow is, uh, uh, will not be presented publicly on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, it's only through our Facebook, I mean, our uh, webpage at fountaintheater.com. My guest is also the author of several other plays, including Amistad Voices, Club Harlem, Kid Zero, and her plays have been performed in theaters all across the country. She's a performer, a lecturer, an activist, and novelist, co-author of the, the 600 page family saga, Some Sing, Some Cry, which she co-wrote with her real life sister, Entezaki Shange. She's a graduate of Harvard University and was named the inaugural Humanist in Residence at the National Endowment for the Humanities. So it is my pleasure to welcome Aoife Baeza. Aoife? And there you are, you made it. <laughs> hooray, hooray, hooray. Welcome, thanks so much for doing this, uh, for joining us today, Aoife. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. It's so good to see you again. It's great to see you. It's been a long time. Yes. Um, so you, are you in, in Rhode Island? Is that where, where you're at now? Oh, my goodness, no. Uh, I am in uh, Chevrolet, Maryland. Uh, I moved down to um, the Washington area because uh, I, I thought <laughs> that the Till Trilogy uh -huh. uh, which is the culmination of this work, was going to debut this year at Mosaic Theater of DC. Right. Uh, because of our current uh, pandemic, that has been pushed off until next year. But I have moved to the um, Maryland area, just outside of DC. Oh, OK. And, and how are you holding up the, these? I know that the, the, the trilogy is on hold, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. But how are you just holding up during this, this uh, COVID period? Well, uh, I, I, I think pretty well. I've got uh, an abundance of work. It, it's a challenging time for all of us as human beings. Uh, as artists, as theater artists, as we try to figure out how to uh, reinvent ourselves, how to reinvigorate our form, what it's going to look like when we come back, how do you make work in the now. Um, and uh, so I, I tried to take on these challenges. Uh, so it's been a very active uh, and kind of uh, agitated uh, in, in a good way. Um, the, the times that call for um, such a uh, focused energy uh, as uh, for public thinkers like ourselves. Right. I've been talking to a lot of different writers uh, and, and there seems to be two different minds. Some are really using this time uh, to hunker down and to get a lot of writing done and, and to go inward and 
uh, and, and, and do that kind of uh, self-reflection and use the creative time. Others are, are just, they can't concentrate and they're, they're too freaked out or, they, or too distracted. Uh, are you somewhere in the middle or it sounds like you're, you're using this time? This seesaw, you know, it is very challenging to, to concentrate, to, uh, to focus. And even as you're doing that, to determine how you're going to speak and what you want to say as the the um, uh, the turbulence of the political, social, you know, climate environment. It's, it's really a very um, uh, swirling, uh, disorienting time. Mm -hmm. So how you harness your energies to to that that's that's what I take on as my challenge since I decided I want to be, I am a writer. Uh, you know, how do I speak to this time? Right. I anticipate, how do I continue to visualize you know, where not only I want my work to go, but you know, where, how am I seeing the world and where do I envision the world going? So it's a, it's a, it's a, a constant tug of war internally between the disorientation and the, the, the challenge and commitment of focus. Are you doing, are you writing, uh, as well as the work on, on the trilogy, on, on your work as a playwright, are you also doing uh, narrative work or fiction? Uh, not now, I've got two com outstanding commissions, so <laughs> that's kind of- uh -oh, got, you better get busy. <laughs> that makes you focus in a way. Yeah. But even those narratives are shifting. I, I've got a really interesting project in New Iberia, Louisiana, uh, working uh, with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Oh. Uh, now, uh, what's become a three year residency, repurposing and re envisioning uh, an old plantation site, Shadows on the Cache, and engaging the local community in incorporating the African American story into uh, the narrative and the African-American presence. Uh, uh, and so that has been really exciting, creative workshop with 12 local writers. And uh, we're going to premiere um, that work digitally in the fall. Uh, so I've got you know, 12 burgeoning uh, playwright poets uh, who are really examining uh, their personal history as well as the um, the social and political history of African Americans in this really incredibly rich um, region. And I was checking on everyone today just to make sure everyone's safe. And right. So, oh, of course. They, of course. Is everyone all right? Are they all right? Yeah, they they really didn't get much damage in that in that area at all. So I was very grateful for that. So it was another source of turbulence, you know, the past. Oh. Yeah, I mean, even the planet is is in upheaval. Um, uh, now, tell me, you you were you were born in New Jersey, right? Yes, yes. Trenton, New Jersey. In Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, tell me about your parents. Uh, well, two remarkable people. I mean, to be a dramatist, you know, I I, I was born into the right family. Uh, but, um, my dad, uh, Paul. Kobe Williams uh, was a um, surgeon and a political social activist, community leader in New Jersey, uh, and uh, was actually, you know, home, uh, a native son of New Jersey, if you will. Mm -hmm. And my mother um, is, was a, a social worker and a college professor at the College of New Jersey. She actually founded uh, the uh, Department of Social Work at the College of New Jersey, and was one of the founding members of the African American Studies uh, Department at the college. And she grew up in the Bronx, and uh, so, you know, the, I, 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 I uh, inherited a, a, a fighting spirit from both of them. They were tremendously um, creative individuals as well. My dad was a photographer and painter, an amateur magician who used to do magic shows for all of our parties. And it was a great aficionado 
of uh, the music of the African diaspora long before um, it uh, was a phenomenon. And um, uh, my mother was um, just a, a brilliant elocutionist and um, um, reciter of poetry. She commanded uh, many great poets from Shakespeare to Browning to Dunbar by heart. So we grew up with her, you know, just reciting from memory. And um, they were both uh, incredible storytellers. I came into a family of storytellers and of course, as you see, my sister and I, you know, took that to another uh, level, but uh, we, we came by it lightly from both sides of the family. It sounds like an amazing house to grow up in, that that there were all of these interesting people coming and going. Uh, I remember reading an article or something about uh, what Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie and the jazz musicians being, do you have memories of, of, of all yeah. of these people? And My dad and Dizzy were really good friends. Oh, and really? <laughs> I, had, I had a great uh, fortune. I lived in Englewood, New Jersey for a moment when I was yeah, on the East Coast. And I was in the shopping center with my dad getting groceries. And uh, Dizzy Gillespie came in. He said, ah, you know. And so he befriended <laughs> me. And uh, you know, the last couple of years of his life, he would just stop by and, you know, I can't, I said, I can't believe it. You know, I'm learning how to hear a little so Dizzy Gillespie. <laughs> I'm, fine, said, I'm going up to Newport. You know, you want to ride? I'm like, okay, cool. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> Oh my God! Wow. And uh, uh, he was also like a good friends with Chico Hamilton, and uh -huh. I think those were his closest jazz friends. And um, that, but that the household was uh, constantly a buzz with. Uh, individuals from Africa, um, when dad was uh, doing his residency at Homogene Hill Hospital in St. Louis, which was a major training hospital for black physicians uh -huh. um, for, for decades. Uh, and it had a really international um, body of, of training physicians. And so uh, I met um, people from, from Togo and from Ghana and from of Pakistan, and, and uh, so it, 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 it was a household that uh, was global in its perspective uh, from my earliest recollection. And you have uh, two sisters and a brother, is that right? Yeah, and... Um, Baby sister, my younger sister, uh -huh. uh, is a former ambassador, uh, and uh, to Niger. Right. And currently working with the uh, Carter Center uh, as the observation team that is uh, observing the uh, peaceful transition negotiations in uh, Mali. And she's going to be teaching at the uh, Yale International School next semester. And my brother is a practicing attorney in Austin in New York. And in um, uh, the Social and political activists, we, we come by that. That was, that was part of the mantra of our growing up. I kind of reduced it to one maxim. Uh, you will never be a servant, but you must always serve your people. Oh. That's part of the job of being an artist, I, I think, as well, isn't it? Yes. Um, so, so was it was it growing up in in this house where where there was art and music and conversation uh, uh, that uh, led you into a life in the theater? And I know that you've done many things, and it not. Uh, I'm always curious to know if there's like a moment, uh, uh, if there's like a, the magic moment of when of sitting in a theater and watching a play when we're a kid and we see. Uh, a performance that changes our life or a teacher that that changes the direction of our of our destiny or a parent is there is there a magic person or a magic event 
anything that was free theater, you know, we went to theater all the time. Yeah, my, my aunt who worked for the city of New York uh, would uh, get you know, free tickets to Broadway when you could do that. Uh -huh. and I was her goddaughter. That was my special treat. I got to see, you know, so many working at uh, Royal Hunt of the Sun and Hollies and, and uh, you know, down to, you know, uh, mainstreamers like, you know, um, what's the Christmas story? 30, 34th Street. Um, mm -hmm. Miracle on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Miracle on 34th Street. Right. And, uh, um, then uh, in St. Louis, whenever Forest Park in the summertime, when they would have their summer performances, we went regularly. So I saw Kissy Kate and Madame Butterfly. And, mm -hmm. and but I, I think the moment, um, there were three actual moments where I had transformation experience that, in relation to theater. One was when we went to Mexico on a family trip. I think I was 12. And I pleaded with my mother for some reason I had to see the Ballet Folklorica. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the last day we were there, you know, she tiptoed in and said, And um, uh, there was a performance of a deer dance, which was just a solo performer, a solo dancer. Uh, in ritual costume, very you know, like kind of a loin cloth and a feather a, a headdress with antlers and um, you know, percussive bells or shells on his ankles and, mm -hmm. and wrists. Uh, and that solo dancer so embodied spiritually that this the entity of the deer and the spirituality of this uh, and it, it, it was across a, a, a culture but but it, it was so magical to me I just was transported someplace else watching this this one individual on stage and how old were you well Close. Then that summer, I came home and we were, we were doing this meeting thing, and I stumbled across Thornton Wilder's Out of Town. And uh, I read it. I didn't see Out of Town until you know, 15 years later, but when I read that piece and I saw that there was this fair stage, and from this fair stage, this world emerged. Yeah. I just was mesmerized, and maybe it was the two experiences together, but the, the bareness became kind of one of my signature. Yes. On that very moment, seeing that you could actually generate just a vision of the world from the sparsest of elements. Uh, and then lastly, Saki and I played hooky uh, when I was a sophomore and went to see Murat Saad. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, that's, that's bound to make an impression. <laughs> Off the bus, you know. We as the school, you know. If you can, I, I don't want to be. I don't want to be home and try to tell my mother I don't know where you are. So I'm going with you. <laughs> and then we went to see Marat Saad, and uh, it was obviously transformative. Oh my God! Oh yeah, of course. Uh, so those three moments sealed my fate. <laughs> I, I so agree with you. I've, I've always loved the kind of theater that uh, creates magic out of nothing. I love having an audience come into the theater, sit down, look at a bare stage. There's like nothing there. And then the lights go down and then the lights come up and this world is created. It's like with, with Emmett Till, with the Ballad of Emmett Till is like that, you know, uh, that this whole world and these lives unfold and then it's all over and then it goes to black and it's gone the lights come up and there's nothing there. And it's, yeah. it was all magic. You know, it was all in, in the mind. Uh, that's the kind of theater uh, I love as well. Uh, speaking of, of transformation, I, I'm really curious uh, to ask you about 
the, 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 the moment and the time in your life when you decided to change your name. Mm. Uh, to, uh, and what, what, what led to that? Can you, can you tell me a little bit about, about what brought you to that uh, decision and what that was like for you and, and, and your family? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, it, there, it, 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 it's got two, two things of thought. One was in, in the period of, of, of Black cultural nationalism, awakening to Black consciousness, Black identity. And, uh, you know, I, I came up smack dab in the middle of that of that, is not quite to the tail end of that era. And um, I wanted then to, to, to have uh, an identity that was more um, pointedly uh, and, and uh, by choice African, by announcement. Right. And like so many of my uh, colleagues, Zaki um, um, and uh, Muhammad Ali, many many of my my colleagues who who uh, went a step further, uh, embracing the Muslim faith as part of uh, a, a claiming of an identity that that was self determined uh, and self determined uh, as as an African presence, and so that's where the impetus originally came from, and. So I asked a colleague of mine to uh, um, give me a name that was, you know, um, this was a, a friend who was training to be a yoga priest. And he gave me the name Ifa. And uh, then he gave me a, a, a second name, Iyaun. Uh, the, the, the entire original name was Nigerian or Yoruba. Uh, Ifa meaning one with powers of divination and Iyali being daughter of Oshu. Uh, and um, so the, the, the second name was challenging because no one spelled it right, pronounced it right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, including me, right. It, yes, it had, it had every vowel except, <laughs> you know. And uh, so um, Bayesa, I discovered was uh, uh, Zulu, right? And it's a it's a it's a name that um, is a, um, it's a an announcement. Uh, they say Bayesa Bayesa means somebody's somebody's coming, someone important's coming down the road, right? But originally, it was the name that the heralds would use uh, to announce that the royal family was coming. So I said. Well, that feels like my family. <laughs> and, and, and what it allowed me to do using Ifa and Bayesa was to embrace the whole sub-Saharan. I don't know exactly where my ancestors have come from. Uh -huh. Closer now with, you know, with um, uh, some of the DNA um, uh, research programs. But at the time, uh, I couldn't determine where my ancestors were from. And spiritually, I wanted to identify with, with the, the, um, with the ethos of the African experience. We don't know where we are from. Uh, so I could embrace wherever my ancestors were in, in the entirety of our experience, metaphorically, by, by my name, uh, kind of doing a full embrace of the whole sub uh, in within those two names. Uh, then personally, um, my original Christian name, which I love, you know, uh -huh. Wanda Celeste Williams, first right. of all, the end of the alphabet, so I was always last. Always last, last right. <laughs> and uh, secondly, uh, uh, my mother in her, her own kind of uh, prescience, uh, named me the Wanderer, because of the way my eyes started about when I, when I first opened them. And um, I wanted to be more grounded as an adult. I thought if I changed my name, I would change my faith. Uh, and I did somewhat, but not that part. 
<laughs> I'm still the wanderer. I still live many, many places and more before I'm done, you know. <laughs> and uh, how did your parents react when, when you shared that you wanted to do this? It was an evolution. It was an evolution uh, uh, initially. They, and they went through all kinds of when, when we changed our hair, or, you know, that, that was it. Right. I, I saw my parents fly when, when Zaki <laughs> got her. <laughs> I said, wow, I'm feeling, you know. So uh, I did mine more quietly. Uh, and it took them, it, it took them time to, to uh, evolve to that, but um, uh, in their mature years, they embraced uh, uh, they embraced my mm-hmm. and at the same time, um, because I didn't, I didn't have a, uh, I didn't have a hostility toward my childhood name. It was just the name of my childhood. Right. So, you know, whenever my mom was stressed, she would say, "Mom," I'm like, "Okay." Uh oh, so, I'm in trouble. <laughs> or that she needed to talk to me heart to heart. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's her. That that's still her her baby, you know, and um, so we, we, we I, um, I don't think there was, there, there wasn't much tension after the first few years. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, you and your sister and Azaki were uh, very close, of course. Uh, um, t- tell me a little bit about, about your relationship for from everything that, that I know, it's huge, but I mean, it, it seems like like the two of you were were symbiotic in some way, or had, had such a deep connection that uh, that lasted your in, your entire life. And can you just talk a, a, a little bit about that? Uh, what what is my line? I've got a little piece called uh, "Me and Z is two characters," you know. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, you want to know about my sister? I could write a book, an encyclopedia. You know? <laughs> of course. Short form, readers' digest form. Um, we're a year and a half apart, and uh, uh, because yeah, I, I think I'm an empathic person. Um, uh, I uh, always had a close relationship, understanding. You know, I was paired with my sister a lot. Take your sister. <laughs> <laughs> and so in many instances, I would wind up being kind of ahead of my time uh, because I was I was the tag along. Uh-huh. In other instances, you know, so I, I would get things introduced to me you know, kind of boldly, as in Murat Sahn, uh, or, you know, Malcolm X, you know. You're so stupid, you know, you know, you know, and you get the book thrown at you, and when you pick it up, it's like, wow, this oh, is. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we had a, 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 a symbiosis that, that uh, was a childhood rivalry that, 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 that grew into um, uh, 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 respect. Um, and, um, I, when Zaki started writing poetry um, and, and started doing this remarkable work, you know, I was, I was really, I think, um, more attuned to that than perhaps she was to my writing. Mm. Being firstborn, first, you know, firstborn children are very, uh, only ch- you know, children in their minds. Or, right. Because part of their lives they were that <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that I I could see what her work needed and uh, which was um, uh, or I, I decided what her work needed let's put it that way <laughs> because her trajectory as a as a poet would have taken her it, it would have taken her to Stella Heights but just a different one right um, that you need to let theater artists do the work. <laughs> That's what I love. I love theater, and I just love that. And you know, it's a, there's, 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 there's more here than I'm, I'm hearing from you as a solo poet. 
Ah. Um, so uh, I was instrumental in introducing her to Oz and 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 getting her to even acquiesce to letting other people say her words. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many poets you know, but there's this a big argument about whether anybody else should ever say your words. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and that was, that was transformative for the world, but it also was for Zaki as an artist, you know, just opening her up to uh, uh, the, the potential for this 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 form, the uh, recorded poem that uh, is created, uh, and Absolutely. to to multiple voices, uh, so that uh, she could create then a body of work that that was exploring that form. Uh, so when 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 Colored Girls opened in seventy six, mm -hmm. and 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 it became this landmark event, this, this uh, transformative experience for, for Black women, for, for Black female writers. Um, what was that period like for you and, and for her? Was it? It was, it, uh, well, it was challenging. I so, can imagine, yeah. Because part of it was this. I had just, uh, I had written, um, read uh, an ad in showbiz newspaper in New York. Uh -huh. um, uh, new Federal Theater was looking for new plays. I sent the very first play that I thought was ready for the world and, and it got optioned and was produced at New Federal Theater. Uh -huh. That's what I started calling my sister saying, who was writing then poems about suicide. So that was the other kind of personal issue. I said, you know, because um, uh, our mother is a social worker and part of her mantra was, you know, there's never anything in life worth committing suicide. And, you know, there's never anything worth that. And uh, if, if somebody starts talking about it, take them seriously. So here's my sister writing all these, you know, this title. So I'm taking her seriously. So part of it was a ploy, like whatever that environment is that is causing you to do that, you need to come away from that. So theater was in a way a kind of ploy because I had just gotten my work. I said, you know, this stuff is easy. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta do it. It's so easy. I just said it. And, and as, as a matter of fact, it was. It was, you know, because mm -hmm. she, they started working on the piece and, and within, you know, a year trajectory, it was on Broadway. So in a way I was, I was you know, telling her future. I was not, however, telling my own. <laughs> <laughs> and um, because I was, I was still looking for my voice. I was still finding right. it. Right. Didn't take any time to find it, and um, so that experience put me on another track to uh, to find my distinction because. So many people then were looking for me to be a replica voice or be uh, right. you know, that I came. I said, "Well, no, I didn't come after I came before." But you know. <laughs> right, right, and 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 you have your own voice. I don't wonder. I've got you know that took me have to you know let me see if I can can hear my voice. Right, and um, it's interesting. Um, I was one of being dramaturg, if you will, on the piece. I didn't even know what that term was. Mm -hmm. But uh, it didn't have an opening. And that poem, The Dark Phases of Womanhood, I remember from one of the many readings I had gone through. I didn't even remember it. Yeah, you know, I searched through all of the books, all of her notebooks, uh, called all of her friends, and finally Tawani Davis had a copy. She read it to me over the phone. I took it into rehearsal, and that became the, the now classic opening. But the reason I remembered it was that line: "She doesn't know the sound of her own voice." Ah. And what I, that's what I was looking for, and so her poetry resonated for me. But I was still then in search of that. Right. After that experience, 
<laughs> well, and and you found it with uh, Emmett Till, certainly. Um, and, and the Ballad of Emmett Till had a long developmental process uh, period, right? I think it was developed uh, where at the O'Neill and, um, uh, and at the Goodman uh, and and at various readings and had a long, a long developmental process. It was first a, a one act and then it expanded to a, a, a full length play, right? Yes, and in fact, it was at the Fountain Theater with the wonderful late Ben Bradley. That's right, and John Wesley, yeah. And, and my uh, late and beloved friend, John Wesley. That yes. I just introduced to you here. That's right, that's right. Um, I started working on uh, the notion of, of, of doing a piece of it came circuitously. I was working on a fictional piece, and this voice came through to say, bear witness to one of the characters. And I said, bear witness to what? And um, it came to me that this character had been a witness in the death of uh, Emmett Till and had not come forward. So I took myself to the library thinking I was going to, you know, do research, right? And and very quickly realize that the call to bear witness was not to my fictional character, but to me. So then I started uh, doing this um, uh. Uh, exploration, doing um, uh, both the uh, looking at the secondary sources, but it became clear as I examined the secondary sources that there were you know, too many contradictions. So then I went to primary sources and then I went to interviews and I did the geographic uh, uh, exploration, you know, literally walking in his shoes to his home, to his old school, to uh, the, the, the places that he, he uh, uh, walked. Last week. Wow! And um, what did that feel like to 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 walk into a, a home or a house or on a road or at the river or to be in these places? It's what did that feel like? Uh, it was yeah, whatever was the it, it was very so uh, in some instances it was just wonderfully brilliant when I went to. Uh, what is now the uh, Emmett Till uh, Academy, his old school, Makash, um, they were doing a ceremony uh, for the renaming of the school. And uh, I could, it was still supremely polished floors. There was a pride in the student body. I met uh, many of his classmates at that uh, and I met Mr. Spears, who told me, yes, so occasionally I have to discipline his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, and, and a, a young man, uh, well, a 13-year-old, he escorted me to the auditorium. I said, you know, how does it feel that, you know, that the school is being uh, named that? And he said, well, it feels pretty good, you know, because that, uh, you know, and until changed the world, and that tells me that I can too. And so that was- There it uh, is, yeah. And yeah. Uh, then on the other hand, when I went to Glendora, it was the home of J.W. Milan, uh, oh. the principal architect of his abduction and murder. Um, uh, they had just torn down, the family had just torn down the Milan house and there were um, it, was, it was just rubble, but even in the, the, the imaging of the rubble, it looked like bodies and bones. And uh, uh, I, when I went by that grave site, uh, I, I, it was unhallowed ground. I couldn't step on it. I, mm. I put on the ground. I'm like, no, no, no. I, I, I can't. Yeah, because the energy was so predatory. Mm. And, uh, but then in the, the by the river with the Tallahatchie where his body emerged, right. uh, there, there was an arbor of 
um, trees uh, that uh, made it feel like a sacred site. It's a, a frame that stuff. Um, and um, then uh, on the Black Bayou Road with a bridge uh, uh, from which they tossed his body. Um, it, they, they, the road disappears, so the bridge literally fades into, into jungle, fades into brush. Right. It, that also was a great heaviness in song. Uh, like Emmett, I took a one day cotton picking. <laughs> did you? <laughs> I, I, did I did. What, it, what that was like? Yeah. Uh, that was, I said, yeah, I get you, brother. You know, I wouldn't have lasted more than half a day either. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was a remarkable experience. Oh, my I, God. Oh, yeah. So many incredible people who shared this little, you know, just tiny pieces of, 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 of the story mm -hmm. that start to uh, then weave, a, weave a, a, a garment. Well, that, one of the things that I love so much about what you've done with the Ballad of Emmett Till was, was how you've humanized this, 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 this young man like you're saying on this trip of touching things and, and it, it, it be, becomes tangible. He's become such a myth. Uh, he's been uh, mythologized to such a degree. Um, and what, what your piece does in such a beautiful, poetic, theatrical way is you, you, you resurrect the boy and we get to know the, 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 the human being and we fall in love with him, and he's annoying. And he's a kid, you know, and and you love him. And um, so much of of what racism racism does is is a dehumanization of the other. And what what the Ballad of Emmett Till, what you've done, is you've you've brought the human being. Reminded that this is this was a human being. This was a boy, a real flesh and blood uh, uh, young man, and and you do it so beautifully with the the, the language and and the, the the as I say the, the theatricality of how it's done, the kaleidoscopic going in and out of memory and and dream world and. Um, uh, it, 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 I, I wanted to ask you one of the things that I think was is so was so striking too was the idea of the whistle of everything when in all the history books history books and all the books that the research you you read about the wolf whistle and the, he whistled at her and that was one of the one of the you know targeting events that that caused uh, everything and i and i was astounded and blown away and loved how in your play the wolf whistle comes out of his stuttering that that it that it wasn't meant as a kind of a predatory thing at all that it was Coming through out of your stuttering was that is that an original idea uh, of yours? Is that was was that idea something you found in the research? Uh, that was actually uh, based on my interviews with his cousin and his young uncle, the Simeon uh, uh, Wright, his Mose Wright's youngest son. Right. And this second cousin, or uncle, second cousin, and his first cousin, Neil Parker. Uh, uh, who was also on that trip? They were they were tremendously uh, helpful, um, and um, they were on that trip to the store and money and and said that it was a wolf whistle. And so, I, in, in in that circumstance, as a as a researcher and as a writer, um, I tried to uh, a, a accommodate multiple. I said there, there may be a multiple truths here. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a mechanism because I talked to a classmate who said, yes, that was a mechanism that we were taught in elocution class. We had elocution class in public school you know, for, for um, uh, kids who had a stutter. 
and that was one of the mechanisms that they were taught. And then uh, Mrs. Uh, um, Till Mobley said that, that that was something that she had taught herself. So I said, well, you know, all of those things may actually be true. Mm -hmm. Yes, it becomes part of how he negotiates. You know, one doesn't preclude the other. So I tried to, uh, uh, as much as I could, allow for, you know, people's memory to be yeah. on. And um, then it's, we, you know, as, as our understanding of, of uh, certainly um, relationship of courtship, as that, as that has evolved, uh, the, the wolf whistle in the 1950s, you know, you think of Bogart, you know, when Lauren McCall walks out of the room, you don't really necessarily as a predatory gesture, um, but as a nonverbal gesture of, you know, of, of, of courtship, if you will. And uh, so I was looking at it more as that. Here's a, here's a boy uh, just turned 14 who's just trying on these aspects of masculinity, you know. Exactly. Let me see what that does. Let me see what that does. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, uh, it, it, it was a gesture of, 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 of exploration of, of what it is to be a man. Mm -hmm. you know? And so that led me to my, you know, one of the reasons I, I did the uh, benevolence, which is the, the uh, third play was that what what are aspects of this? We we can never know what happened in that store, even when Caroline Bryant allows for her her memoir to be published twenty five years after her death. Right. We still know because you know she's already perjured herself. So why should we believe what she says now? Exactly. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so. Uh, I wanted to kind of explore what that uh, meant for the boy, and then in this third play to explore uh, what it perhaps meant. Yeah, so you mentioned benevolence, and um, so I, I'm very, as I said to you earlier, I'm just very excited about uh, the Till trilogy, which is this this large project that that you have created. Uh, you've taken the Ballad of Emmett Till and have added two additional plays to create a, a trilogy. Uh, play number one is The Ballad of Emmett Till. Uh, play number two is That Summer in Sumner, which is about the, the murder trial in 1955. And then part three is Benevolence, which is about um, Carolyn Bryant. Well, it's about two, it's, it's about the, the impact of the, the, the event on the Delta. So the first act is is a white couple. The, the first act is is uh, uh, an examination of the killers, <laughs> and then the second act is a, is a black couple uh, that uh, were killed uh, in the wake of Emmett's uh, murder, Clinton uh, and Bill Nelson, and Clinton uh, was. Uh, murdered in broad daylight uh, in December of 1955 by perhaps one of the accomplices in Emmett's murder, who was not tried. And then on the eve of his, of that murder, of that killer's trial, there was no question about you know, who did it in broad daylight. On the eve of his trial, uh, uh, Bueller Melvin's trial, uh, is, run into the river and uh, is, uh, she is killed, but her two children who are in the back seat are rescued. So I look at um, the, the, the ongoing experience uh, and the, uh, even as we make progress, even as we uh, do battle, uh, there, there are 
continued unknown casualties in our struggle for I want to also just quickly remind uh, viewers that if anyone has a question uh, for Eva, please feel free to type it into the chat or the, the Q&A balloon at the bottom of the screen. Um, so the, the, our, our plays, I'm talking about the trilogy now, our, our plays number two and three, are they both, are each of them full length plays? Yes, yes. Uh, um, Emmett is a is a one act, a straight right. bullet ride, ninety minute bullet ride, just like oh. his life. Mm, yeah. Right. Uh, the that summer in Sumner, I think it's a two act. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's but it's 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 so dense. Um, uh -huh. there, there are so many elements. I'm I'm trying to look at the trial from the perspective of the reporters. Uh huh. It, um, and the, the, um, what, what is the, what is the experience and responsibility of bearing witness, actually? Um, and, um, um, it, it really is, is, is looking at, at the, the Black press as, as, as an, as an activist, um, kind of advocate for for democracy, for our struggle. And they, they wind up going down there trying to cover the trial and it's it's such a travesty of justice. They wind up having to try to to um, you know prove the case, to find witnesses, to find evidence, to get it, you know, to get it to the to the um, uh, prosecutor who uh, doesn't want to talk to black people. <laughs> you know, so it's it's um, uh, and yet it, 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 the beginning stirrings of, of integration, as messy and as difficult as it is, these teams of reporters, white and black, and, and even a southern sheriff deputy who who sees who, who kind of sees the light and how 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 uh, 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 is this culture that he is he is defending. He he joins the team and. and helping to find the witnesses and protecting them and bringing them forward. So it's a fascinating story about this wrenching evolution of our um, there's a, a listener who uh, has a question, a viewer. Uh, Paul Williams is asking, are you planning to document your, in, your incredible research uh, regarding Emmett Till into a book? I am. I've gotten um, uh, a lot of uh, support in that regard from two, you know, key figures. Uh, um, uh, Professor John Bracy, who uh, is the former head of the uh, Epitano Studies Department at um, UMass Amherst, where I got my MFA, and also um, John Peavy, who is the chair of um, National Endowment for the Humanities. And one of the reasons that um, we um, facilitated my becoming um, the inaugural um, artist in residence uh, was uh, his fascination with the, the research that I'm doing as an artist, you know, taking primary research and and incorporating it and taking oral research in particular and um, blending that with um, both primary and secondary sources to create a So um, with their enthusiasm, I'm working on that. Um, uh, I want to get the trilogy up and in the world and, and then uh, use that as a, a mechanism to explore both my methodology and uh, some of the research finds that I think are, uh, will, will be a benefit uh, for you know future scholars and students mm -hmm. of this very uh, seminal uh, historical um, There's a, a, another uh, question here, and it, and it was also a, a comment that I made to you earlier that we talked about um, the timeliness, the, the timelessness of uh, of the Emmett Till story and how how deeply it continues to resonate today. Uh, I don't know about you, Aoife, but 
when the George Floyd video uh, surfaced, uh, I, I couldn't stop thinking about Emmett Till. And to me, the link be between George Floyd and Emmett Till was um, just staggering to me. And then, you know, with George, in the George Floyd in incidents, of course, we had a video, we have a video. Uh, and, and with Emmett Till, there was a photograph. But both of these images you know, shocked the world and, and, and changed the course of the civil rights movement. Um, could you talk a, a little bit about how, um, how this story, uh, uh, the Emmett Till story, how deeply it resonates with what's happening in our country right now, today, with, the, with uh, all the violence against Black I know this is a huge, enormous subject, but, but why is this story so, Im so important right now as I believe it is, and I know you feel it is too. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's mythic in its proportions. I mean, it's immaterial. that in that moment, uh, coming after, uh, it's like you, when, you, when you look at history as, as a kind of arcs and waves, you know, there was, Emmett was an arc that then that propelled the civil rights movement. Uh, coming right after Down versus the Board of Ed, which opened up this sense of optimism, this sense of, of, of opportunity and possibility. Uh, and uh, then Emmett's death, uh, which was, you know, just a, a, a frontal assault on that, on that energy, uh, uh, was transmuted by the people into uh, 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 a, a cry and a demand uh, for justice. And, and instead of creating fear, it created a kind of fearlessness. Uh, so you get a John Lewis, you get a Martin Luther King, you get a Rosa Parks who said, you know, I um, was thinking about Emmett's mother that on that day. You get a... That's right. Who, uh, as a teenager, then Cassius Clay was so outraged that uh, he and his friends derailed a train. Um, and uh, th 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 this, and that, 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 that outrage then got, got forged into uh, a, a, a major um, civil rights leader who used his professional athleticism to, to uh, bring attention to the Black struggle. And you, you see in the, 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 the current ethos that we're in so many parallel rhythms, it's, it's like a jazz variation, it's a tragic jazz variation, because underneath the the, the, the parallels is this, this deep frustration and sorrow that we are here yet again. And uh, that in many ways, it has even a different hinder. Emmett Till, uh, uh, the, 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 the beginning of the civil rights struggle was about uh, the, the reckoning of uh, the American South as the remnants of slaveocracy start to get unraveled. We are now in a situation where that we are seeing that 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 pathology is a national pathology. But the Doc Rivers say, you know, we we the black people love this country, but people, but but you know, we we don't understand why this country does not love us back. You know? And it's uh, it's such a um, it's such a sorrowful moment for me that we are uh, we are at this juncture, and yet at the same time. It is that same moment using the, our grief to propel us into 
not necessarily an optimism, but a fearlessness and a, a, a commitment to uh, struggling, to, to fighting for these, you know, what, what are our basic human, uh, the, the, the expectations of, of basic humanity. Uh, and to demand that, to, to demand that our nation that was forged in this, this dichotomy is, is in, it's, uh, in the, the DNA of, our, of the birth of this nation. But within that dichotomy was that promise. And so we, we, we have as a people pushed and pushed and pushed this nation to, to, to get closer and closer and closer to our homes. And um, it's almost as if we, as black people take that on as a part of our, uh, our responsibility. It's, 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 a, it's, it's something we are compelled to do it because we are still battling. But in, in the doing, we awaken the rest of the, the, the country and, and in, in, certain, in other circumstances, the rest of the world to this, uh, this um, I call it, it's a, it's a divine struggle to, uh, as, as humanity uh, the, the sense that that we can recognize ourselves as as a single human being, and that we bring respect to each individual on the planet. To it, it, it's a utopian. Mm. Yeah. It's also uh, aspiration. We struggle to get as close to that idea. Um, and uh, we are reminded uh, every day how far away and that perhaps it is part of this part of this part of the becoming human uh, is is the struggle to to achieve that end. part of part of our species becoming more human entails that stuff. And so Emmett's saga becomes a mythic saga. Um, and I, I see it as a as a, a, a modern foundational myth of who we are as a myth. Part of the of the we only have a, a few minutes left, but I want to ask you this. Um, when the when the George Floyd video uh, surfaced and and um, everyone was was horrified, uh, I, I think for, for for many white people seeing it, there was there was shock and outrage and how could this be happening? Uh, surprise, um, and and I, I think for for many in the black man, not speaking of the black community, of course, but I, I know. There was there's there's horror, but but also the the knowledge that twas ever so that this is that this has this has been happening in our country for centuries, for centuries, um, and like with Emmett Till and the, the 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 publishing of the photograph of him in the coffin, how it shocked uh, white America in, into realizing the, the the horror of racism in this country. Um, so there there. Are, th are there two paths here uh, that, that, that we hope are going to come together in some way? One is, is a reckoning, and, uh, uh, and is, the, is, is the other a, a feeling of, of, of enough, you know, of just enough is enough. And that, uh, what do you, how, how do you want your, uh, uh, is, is there a, a feeling uh, uh, for you of, of a white audience uh, seeing uh, the ballad of Emmett Till and what they take from it being different than uh, a black audience? 
perhaps you know people will depending upon where you are you know i i'm i'm anxious to see what the response is to the work in this time yes when we did it back in 2010 right when there was a different issue or or when i did it at the goodman post katrina you know they, um uh, there, there is a. Uh, I think the the reality of the brutality, the reality of the violence, uh, uh, which was you know captured in that frozen image of Emmett's face. Uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, it's an extrapolation when you see someone being murdered before our own. Right, right. Uh, and when you see a moving, it, it, you, know, you see, see life leave a person. Yes. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it was interesting for me, even as I as I was looking at the play um, a, few, a few weeks ago, uh, and um, that line that Emmett has, "I can't breathe, I can't breathe," I never actually mm -hmm. heard it yeah. in that play. Yeah, it was a line in between some other lines, and yet it. Because uh, he's got a bag on his head, you know. That's not it, you know, but but the way it it resonates becomes yes. something. Yes. And uh, the if it does, I, I had this conversation with with a, a, another interviewer when I was telling him my initial impulse was for people to see, as you were describing to see our humanity, to see through this boy, right. his humanity. Yes. And he said, is the bar that low? You know, like, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Yeah. Uh, that's, it, it, it and, and, uh, and because it's that, you have to really, really you know, get under, and if, if in the, in this case, if if we emerge on the other side with the the, the continued perception and understanding and absorption of that, as opposed to oh, I feel you know, if, if 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 we internalize it in a way, right. um, and uh, I I see that happening with. You know, so many of this um, uh, younger generations of, of people of multiple races coming together, uh, and which is also what happened in the civil rights movement with freedom. Right. right. It, and it, it is it is part of that 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 coalition that that that, that starts to move. Right. Uh, uh, along with the agitation of. Of, of raw emotion that uh, is is that point of enough uh, uh, because uh, you know, that and that's where the fearlessness you know, comes in because you do have to stand at uh, J W Milan was you know was a, a good, the bully is 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 too uh, um, uh, soft the word, you know. He was a terrorist, and and so how you stand up to the face of terror, you know. And uh, sometimes we can only do that, you know, by screaming back, you know, roaring back. Uh, and um, 
So uh, as we navigate this time when we see people who have gotten to their wits and literally uh, figuring out a way to um, respect that, respect the, the grieving and to address the grieving yeah. Yeah. that is at, at this point beyond words and it is beyond we, we are not at peace can we be at peace um, you uh, you you speak of of uh fearlessness um, and, and I know we're, we're, we've gone over, but I just, I'm so enjoying talking with you. Um, you, you talk of, of fearlessness, uh, and I just wanted to share with you a comment uh, from someone in the, in the Q&A, uh, Kathy Scholl. Um, mm -hmm. She says, fearless is one of the characteristics I remember about you, along with kindness and brilliance. But isn't uh, This Is Your Life, Benjamin Franklin, in sixth grade, one of the reasons you became a playwright? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> we were Wanda Williams and Kathy Kern, you know. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, that was my, I did write two plays in the sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all did, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Grant if we could have the auditorium so we can put them on. <laughs> <laughs> so even then, even in sixth grade, you were fearless, right? Yes, in a way, in a way, yes. Right. The mummy's curse. Yes. And someone also asked in the in the chat uh, about uh, if they're unable to see uh, the, the reading tomorrow uh, at four o'clock, if there's going to be an opportunity to uh, see it later. And the answer is yes. Uh, that uh, this uh, presentation will be available online on our website through December uh, 31st uh, uh, on demand. So if you're not able to, to see it uh, tomorrow at four o'clock, uh, you know, please come back and check it out uh, later on. Um, and and I, I'm very excited about this presentation because we're really trying to do something more uh, it's not it's not a, a typical Zoom reading with people sitting there in little boxes. Um, it's it, we've really enhanced it uh, with visuals and uh, music and sound, uh, so it's it's theatrical uh, visually, uh, which is true to the style of the piece. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing. Yeah, that. so it's it's. it's shout out to Mosaic Theater of DC, uh, which will be doing the Tilt Trilogy when we are able to come back in uh, um, 2021. So if you want to see it in the theater, you know, come to Washington when we get ready to put it up. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about that, the, the, the Tilt Trilogy. And at the Fountain Theater, we will promote it uh, and we'll share all the information uh, about the, the trilogy that's going to be opening at the Mosaic Theater, which is in Washington, D.C. As Aoife says, it'll be yeah, at some time, uh, uh, you know, beginning of next year or whenever we're, we're able to, to do it. Um, I'm sorry? Spring of 2021. Spring of 2021. Uh, great. So we will share that information uh, with our people as well. So um, uh, thanks, Eva. Thank you so much for giving your time uh, with, with us today. Uh, I'm, I'm so proud uh, and pleased to be sharing your, your fabulous work, uh, The Ballad of Emmett Till Tomorrow at four o'clock. Uh, it, it's it, it's a, a piece that, that needs to be seen now in, in this moment uh, in our history, uh, not as a history lesson, but as a, as a lesson in humanity, uh, because that's what the what the what the piece does it reminds us that that behind every statistic and every video that we see on our news feed is a human being and is a family um, and like you, what you were saying earlier about about uh, seeing the humanity in each other 
uh, that's what the ballot of Emmett Till does. So I hope that, that uh, everyone will, will watch it either tomorrow at four o'clock or on demand through the rest of the year. So thanks, Eva. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, and that's it for a theater talk for uh, this time. And we'll see you next time. Uh, thanks so much. And thank you, James, uh, backstage for all of your uh, technical wizardry. So that's all for now. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.